Welcome back to Music Kingdom. You spoke, I listened. In this video, we are discussing an album named The Rainbow Goblins by Masayoshi Takanaka. And in addition to that, we will be ranking each song on the album in the order of worst to best. And spoiler alert, even the worst of the bunch are still pretty good. Hang tight. Hey music lovers, my name is Francis. If you'd like to support the work I put into these videos, click the like button and subscribe to the channel. If you'd like to support the channel even further, you'll find Music Kingdom's Patreon and other affiliate links in the description below. All right, so in case you didn't get the memo, we are trying something new in this video. Last week I made a post explaining to you guys that I'm interested in making more talking head videos as a way to monetize the hard work I put into my videos. Because in case you didn't already know, even the biggest, most successful YouTubers who react to and review music and work themselves to the bone hardly make any money from ad revenue. Due to, of course, copyright claims. And so I asked you guys in that post to leave comments naming your favorite albums of any genre by any artist of any decades and whichever one gets the most likes will be the one selected for this video. Truth be told, I was honestly only expecting maybe a handful of comments, but you guys really showed up, which amazed and surprised me with over 50 comments of album suggestions. And so a round of applause for and a shout out to Egbert of the Lamp 4978 who recommended The Rainbow Goblins by Masayoshi Takanaka. And look, I'll be honest, for this type of video, for this format of video, I'm not 100% sure that a concept album is the best fit, simply because concept albums, the songs kind of blend into each other. A lot of them tend to sound like each other. Either way, fuck it. Let's have some fun. The Rainbow Goblins is the seventh studio album by Masayoshi Takanaka, released in 1981. Now, to my knowledge, it is based on an Italian children's book released in 1977, also titled The Rainbow Goblins. Now, what is there to say about this album? How would I describe this album to someone who's never heard it before? And by the way, I will be linking the album in the description below so that you can either go listen to the album and then come back to this video, or you can watch this video, see how I rank the songs, and then go with that in mind and listen to the album. Either way, how would I describe this album? And to be honest, Honest, Egbert of the Lamp 4978 described it pretty much better than anybody else could, certainly better than I could. But even still, if I had to put it in a box, and this album is really not the type of album you can put in any box, but to oversimplify it, yes, I would describe it best as fusion with jazz elements, absolutely, with blues elements, absolutely. In my opinion, though, you've also got the most subtle, tiny hints of metal in there. Not to say any of it's actually metal, but if you've heard the album before, hopefully you know what I'm trying to articulate. But then on top of that, you have orchestras involved, you have acoustic guitars involved, you have narrations and spoken word pieces involved as well that really make this such a work of art that is, as mentioned, hard to fit into a single genre or box. On a less serious note, the best way I can describe the overall aesthetic, mood, atmosphere, vibe, energy, of the album would be if the 70s work by prog rock band Genesis had a baby with Nintendo, and then that baby was raised by the album Random Access Memories by Daft Punk, you would have more or less this album. Kid you not, that is as best as I can articulate and assess it. However, on a more serious note, this album is truly so creative. And if you've been a long time subscriber to this channel, you know that I really value any body of work in music that is either creative, original, inspired, fresh, expressive, artistic. And to be totally honest, this album has to be one of the most creative and artistic albums I have probably ever heard in my life. Not just because it's off the wall, not just because it's kind of weird in its own way, not just because it's based off a storybook, but even if we're talking about composition and production, it is so well done, in my opinion. All right, with all that out of the way, it's time to rank the songs in order from worst to best. Then just a heads up, as mentioned, even in my opinion, the worst songs on this album are still very good because it is a great album. And in addition to that, I recognize and acknowledge there are technically 14 tracks 
on this album. However, I will be ranking 13 to one. The reason being there is a song on this album that is very short and is so obviously an introduction to the following track because it is a concept album. And so to kind of judge that very short introductory track as its own thing, in my opinion, is unfair. So I will be grouping those two songs together as one song, which is why we have a total of 13 in this video as opposed to 14. Okay, starting at number 13, my personal least favorite track from the album. I am so sorry if this happens to be your personal favorite. I selected as my least favorite, Just Chuckle. Now, what is there to like about the song? In my opinion, I did enjoy it. I thought it was very fresh. I thought the melody was creative enough and it was pretty good at keeping you engaged all the way. Some of the other songs on this album that are a bit longer in their own way, because of perhaps how repetitive they can be, not necessarily in a bad way, but it's easier to lose engagement with some of the other songs on this album. And for this one, I think because of how fun and happy and joyful and positive it is, you're very into it the entirety of it. In addition to that, I also thought that the outro to the song specifically is very pretty as it transitioned into the next track, of course, with it being a concept album. I thought that was perhaps the best aspect of the song. Not to say I like when it ends, but I like how it ends. Now, why is this for me dead last? Well, for me personally, the rest of this album is like a visionary album. It's this inspired work of art. And this one track in particular, in my opinion, just feels like the least imaginative one. It feels like the, the one that is the least creative. It's just kind of nice. You know, I would listen to it with the windows down in the car, that type of thing. I think more so than anything to take away from this song, it's more so for me when compared to the rest of the album. This one just doesn't, hit me quite the same. And I would argue that perhaps of all of the other songs on this album, it is one of the more simple compositions. Up next at number 12, I chose the song titled Soon. And this one's interesting because depending on my mood, I could have put this one a lot higher. And then of course, you listen to the rest of them all over again and you're just like, yeah, there are 11 songs in my opinion that I enjoyed more than soon, but I certainly liked it more than just Chuckle personally. I loved the groove in this song and I love especially the latter half of this song. It kind of has this subtle breakdown where it kind of simplifies musically. And of course the star of this song's show, if you will, is the guitar solo. And just a heads up, you will be hearing me mention guitar solos a lot in this video because Masayoshi is a guitarist and a majority of this album is him doing some bitchin' solos throughout. And this is absolutely one of them where that really does shine. And so perhaps in my opinion, it doesn't shine as much as the other ones. Reason being a lot of the other songs on this album leave an impression. They really leave you thinking, God, that was a great song. This song in particular, in spite of the amazing solo and the great groove that I really enjoyed, I would say that this one felt a bit mindless. As opposed to Just Chuckle, and I liked how fresh Just Chuckle was because it kind of kept you engaged throughout, this one had a bit of the opposite effect. This one almost felt like background music that you'd play in a movie or a show where they're doing some kind of montage or when you're getting ready for work in the morning, something that's just a good background song. And that's not necessarily a knock against it because a lot of people enjoy listening to background types of music. So because of those reasons, yes, I think the song is nice. Yes, I enjoyed it, but I feel like it's not very memorable and that's okay. Moving on up next at number 11, I chose the song Plumed Bird and pardon me if it's Plumbed Bird, but there's just one M, so I'm just going with Plumed. Um, now this one, uh, emotionally, subjectively, I wanted to put this one last and I feel like that's going to be an unpopular opinion and I ultimately did not and I chose to do it at 11 simply because this is arguably one of the best guitar solos of the entire album. And as I mentioned, there are quite a few of them. So for this one to be arguably the best on the album, by default, you cannot put this last or even second to last. So I felt comfortable doing it at 11. Now, for me, this song definitely evolves. It's definitely the type of song that as it gets closer and closer towards the end, it grows and grows and it's kind of a slow burn in its own right, which I can appreciate and I absolutely acknowledge. But other than that amazing guitar solo, which I cannot praise enough, the rest of the song just feels a little bit empty. And while the solo is absolutely insane, I just wish that more was going on around and beneath or behind the solo. And in this song, there really, in my opinion, just isn't. And in other songs on this album, 
there is. All right, arriving at our top 10, getting better and better in my opinion, I chose for number 10, Rainbow Was Reborn. I realize it's all subjective, but for me, basically from this point at number 10 to number one, all of the songs are truly great. I enjoyed them so much, and it's really just going closer and closer to absolute perfection. But for me, Rainbow Was Reborn is absolutely beautiful. It's definitely a slower groove than the previous three that I mentioned. However, you're not really sacrificing any bad assery because you still have that guitar, you still have the bass guitar, but in this one, they're injecting a lot of strings into it. And just subjectively speaking, I am always such a sucker for strings, at least when used tastefully. And in this case, it's a lovely contrast of this kind of nasty groove with this injection of beautiful strings that combine for this amazing aesthetic and atmosphere in a song that really hits you right in the feels without of course hitting too deep because it is still a fun groovy song as mentioned. It just really balances pretty with groovy at the same time, which impresses me. The final minute in particular really beefs up orchestrally to where it becomes less about that chill, Groove. I don't know if any of you guys have heard the song Cool Cat by Queen, released around the same time, I believe that's 1982, this is 1981. Similar to that, where a lot of the song feels that way, but then towards the very end, it almost transforms or mutates into this song that is more so strings and orchestral than the groove. And I just thought that was a lovely evolution and journey of the song from start to finish. All right, up next at number nine, I chose the song, The Sunset Valley. And the reason I'm smiling so large right now is because right before hitting record on the camera, I just had it playing to just kind of refresh everything because I heard this yesterday and I'm wanting everything to be fresh in my memory as I talk about each track and <laughs> I almost wish I, I ranked it higher, but I know I had my reasonings and I'm gonna stick to the order I chose. But honestly, the Sunset Valley is just such a joyful, happy, uplifting experience. Now, is it perfect? No, in my opinion, this is perhaps one of the songs on the album that sounds the most dated. And I wanna acknowledge that's not necessarily bad because why do we listen to older music in the first place? Because it sounds like the time it came from. So I acknowledge that it's, it's not necessarily something I'm holding against the song in a super harsh way, actually quite the contrary, because even though it does sound dated perhaps more than some of the other songs on this album, I still feel that for when this album came out, that production was absolutely ahead of its time. And let's forget about it being dated just for one second, because as a production, it is so intricate and sophisticated in my opinion. On one hand, very subtly in the background, you do have that orchestra. You've got a very satisfying mix of the synth keys with the guitar solos, kind of doing both things at the same time, kind of taking turns at times. And then all of a sudden you're hit with acoustic guitar solos as well. And you're just teleported to this place where genres of music do not exist and just getting lost in it, you know, just kind of bopping along, just raising your vibe, which in its own right is impressive to have a song that boosts you so much. But what's very impressive is simultaneously, it is so advanced musically at the same time. And I will say perhaps of all the other songs on this album, this one in particular, maybe one or two others, definitely reminds me the most of the album Random Access Memories by Daft Punk. So much so that I am now 110% convinced that in the early days of creating that album, Daft Punk must have listened to this album, or at least music like this, Japanese music of the 70s and 80s, because I mean, my goodness, it sounds so similar. Very good song in my opinion. And honestly, from here on out, they're all great. Okay, let's move on to number eight on this list. I chose The Moon Rose. And I'm smiling again because I just played it again before hitting record on the camera. And it is actually the exact song right after The Sunset Valley. So in many ways, it has a lot of the same feels and melodies of The Sunset Valley. So my thoughts for The Moon Rose, I'm not gonna repeat myself and be redundant and say the same things I liked about The Sunset Valley. The reason I have The Moon Rose ahead of it, even though they're so similar, is because this one is more centric on the guitar solo. So take the greatness of The Sunset Valley, which is already an exceptionally well done song, and then throw in a bitchin' solo on top of it where that's more the star of the show this time around, and, 
Another reason why I'm holding my phone in the making of this video is because as I was listening to this album start to finish, I was taking notes of my thoughts on each specific song. And I will acknowledge I was perhaps a few beers deep by the time I got to the Moon Rose. This is what I wrote for the Moon Rose. I'm no stoner, but this made me want to smoke a fat doobie in Hawaii, yet sob at the usage of strings. I'll just leave it at that. All right, at number seven, it's only right. Gobbling, 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 gobbling. That's right, at number seven, we have seven goblins. And I've got to be honest, you guys, this song, I was very tempted to put it in my top five, put it in my top three and I was gonna do it and then I listened to the remaining six that I have ahead of the song and not to be redundant, but they are just that good. But even still, Seven Goblins at number seven is by no means a diss. In my opinion, it is absolutely one of the best on this album. And for starters, let's talk about the pitched vocals. In my opinion, those are pretty much ahead of their time. Now, is Masayoshi Takanaka the only one to do it in his era? Probably not. But what I'm saying is even now in hip hop or even now in R&B, whatever the genre is in terms of production, pitched vocals are absolutely a thing. They are absolutely a trend and a trend that has been around for quite a while that will not die. But I would argue that some of the earliest examples of using it in music would have to be in an album like this. In addition to the pitched vocals, what I will say about this song, perhaps to some degree more than a lot of the other songs on this album, is how gripping it is from start to finish. And in addition to that, how sharp the song feels. And while a lot of the songs on this album feel very sharp, what I mean about this one is, I will not claim to know Masayoshi Takanaka, but I can just picture him in the recording studio, just zoned in, laser focused, just everything is so sharp. Every production element is so sharp and sophisticated and tight. The way it's composed, the way it's constructed, the way it's produced for me is just so, meticulous. Super well done in my opinion. Yet another amazing guitar solo. I love the bass guitar licks as well. And a decent amount of the song had the narration in it. And I've got to be honest with you guys, before listening to this album, I was a little bit skeptical about the narration before hearing it, thinking it might be a, a bit cringeworthy, but no. In my opinion, it is so welcome. Like when I heard that voice telling the story of the goblins, my approach, my reaction instead of cringe was, yes, tell me more. And then of course, the way they mix in the narration with the song in the background for me, it's just, just top to bottom, so well done. Keeping it moving at number six, as mentioned, this is where I'm attaching two songs in one, and it would be Magical Nightlight and Rainbow Paradise. Now, to be honest, I do feel the need to apologize to Egbert of the Lamb 4978. In the album recommendation, it was mentioned that this is the song to keep an ear out for, and that this was the favorite. And while I certainly enjoyed the song enough to put it as high as number six, I cannot subjectively say that it was my favorite. Now, the reason I have it so high, and the reason I have it ahead of Seven Goblins even, is because of how smooth that transition was between Magical Nightlight and Rainbow Paradise. In addition to that, this is another one of those songs on this album that has such an overwhelming emotion of sheer joy and positivity, executed in a way that, in my opinion, is so much more difficult than he makes it seem. And no, while it's not, say, as complex as a song like Seven Goblins, whether we're talking about the transition, whether we're talking about the atmosphere that he nails, or whether we're talking about the numerous varying solos in one song, I couldn't help but put it slightly above Seven Goblins. In many ways, it's just kind of the perfect groove. And I say this very lightly, so do not bombard me with hate in the comments, but this is kind of the get lucky of the album. It's easily accessible, perfectly executed, and has just a little bit of everything. All right, we've made it to the top five, and at number five, in my opinion, I chose the song Thunderstorm. And let me know whether or not you agree, but this is the song, in my opinion, that certainly has a bit of a metal feel. If you make the drums a bit more hard rock, if you make the guitar a bit more hard rock, everything in this song feels like a metal song done in this style of music. I'm struggling to articulate it and I do apologize, but if you've heard this song, hopefully you know what I'm trying to say. Now, is this song's metal feel solely the reason it's number five on this list? No, but having said that, having a metal feel to me more so means 
complexity, compositional complexity, the structure, whether we're talking about the chords used, whether we're talking about the time signatures, whether we're talking about just overall how it's put together. In my opinion, just very intricate. And again, similar to some of the other songs on this album, very much ahead of its time. For me personally, I was gripped from the very beginning. I was gripped in the middle and I was gripped at the end. It held my attention. I stayed very engaged with it. I thought it was a very creative song, top to bottom. It just felt very fresh and it stayed fresh. It seemed like Masayoshi wanted to show off how he could also kind of be a badass as well. And so all that to say, in my opinion, very well deserving of number five on the list. All right, at number four, woo, we are getting to some of my absolute favorites from this album. And this one subjectively, honestly, is right up there for me. And it would be Once Upon a Song. So after the orchestral introduction, this kind of is the first song on the album, setting the tone for the rest of the album. <laughs> and boy, does it set the tone. In my opinion, it is just such an amazing groove. This is the one song on the entire album that feels the most, in my opinion, bluesy, jazzy. And while I acknowledge this album did come out in 1981, the aesthetic of this song feels much more 1970s, even in some respects, late 60s. Of course, like many of the other songs on this album, the guitar absolutely carries the song until, and what makes this song especially good, the strings absolutely take over this song in a way that you precisely want them to. They really come in and steal the show initially to complement the guitar. And then in my opinion, the string usage is just so good, so exquisite that it kind of says, all right, guitar, that's enough. Now it's our time to shine. And then on top of that, towards the end of the song, there's this bit with the piano and a bass guitar going at it. And I literally wrote down, piano towards the end with the bass, was disgusting. Just a great way to set the tone for the rest of the album. And speaking for myself, of all 13 tracks, technically 14, on this album, I could see Once Upon a Song being the one song in particular that I happen to listen to the most. Now, are there three other songs on this album that I believe are technically better? Yes. And one or two of them, yeah, I might play just about as much as Once Upon a Song, but otherwise, all right, now before we discuss the top three songs from this album, in my opinion, first, let's go to the Experts Corner to hear his thoughts. Welcome to the Experts Corner. Today I'm here to talk about the album The Rainbow Goblins by Masayoshi Takanaka. Before this week, I had never even heard of this album, and when I finally listened to it, it was like a gift from above. Starting with that prologue, anyone who knows me knows that I am a huge soundtrack film score person, so this gorgeous orchestral intro sucked me right in and I knew it was gonna be a good ride. Then the rest of the album came and what really struck me was that there's a little bit of everything. So many styles to satisfy any musical craving I might have had. If you want some happy, laid back, sunny vibes, you've got songs like Once Upon a Song in the Sunset Valley. If you want some jazzy complexity with impressive rhythms and harmony, you've got songs like Seven Goblins and Plumed Bird. And if you wanna sit back and relax, you've got songs like that beautiful prologue and Rising Arch. So for me, Something that's very valuable about this album is the fact that it's musically complex and skillfully composed without being pretentious or inaccessible. It's jazzy but catchy, and every song has some good vibes to it. Overall, there isn't a bad song on this album, and it's definitely one that I'm going to be adding to my library and giving another listen. Back to you, Francis. A very special thank you to our expert for chiming in and sharing his thoughts. No expert score this time around, but I'm glad he was included. And now, of course, without further ado, let's get to the top three. At number three, we have the eight minute masterpiece and conclusion to the album, You Can Never Come to this place. Honestly, what is there to say about this truly masterful song? First thoughts for me would be that it absolutely feels conclusive. And yes, I acknowledge that Okay, when I was listening to the song, I was aware that it was the last song on the album. So I realized that that could be influencing that emotion I got and feeling that it was the end of this story, musically speaking. But having said that, I really would argue that the way he composed it, the way he arranged it, the way it was produced, the way it was executed, truly felt like the end of something. It felt like a grand finale. It felt like the culmination of everything, like the end of the fireworks on New Year's Eve. And it also felt like Masayoshi Takanaka was in a way saying, 
Look at what the fuck I just created. In this song, you have for me what was the star of the show, which would be the gorgeous usage of the piano. In addition to that, as always, by this point, you have the exceptional usage of strings. You have absolutely beautiful melodies, compositionally speaking. But to top it off, you have perhaps, in my opinion, the best of the best when it comes to guitar solos on the entire record. I know I've been phrasing them a lot and I know I probably say one of the other solos is one of the best, but this one in the context of it being the conclusion to the record and with it being an eight minute piece of art, in my opinion, this solo is just absolutely insane. It's hard to put into words, but there are some guitar solos that melodically can move you to tears and other guitar solos that blow your mind with how the fuck are they doing that. And in my opinion, this is the perfect marriage of the two. Now, for example, while I listen to a song like Once Upon a Song more than this, subjectively, yes, but you just really can't deny an eight minute conclusive work of art to such an exceptional album. All right, at number two, we have, subjectively speaking, my personal favorite song on this entire album. I do think number one is a better song. It is the best song, but this one for me absolutely left me speechless, and I'm already struggling to find the words right now, and it would be Rising Arch. To give you an idea, most of the songs on this album I did take notes for, my thoughts, how I'm analyzing it, how I'm feeling it, so on and so forth. For Rising Arch, I have the least amount of words typed, in fact, the least of all of the other songs, and that would be exquisite, beautiful, my favorite. And honestly, what more can be said? How do I even put into words my favorite thing or things about the song. And that kind of makes my point. With all of the other songs on this album, I'm able to listen to them with an analytical mind if I try, right? Because usually if I'm listening to music and it's not related to making videos about them on YouTube, I don't listen analytically. I just feel it the way we all do, right? This one, I could not get out of my own way. I just melted into the song. Now, of course, if I were to attempt to articulate the emotions that the song gave me, I would say that it's just the way he nailed the atmosphere in the song, the various, almost eclectic instrumentation in this song, the singing that eventually comes in is so beautifully woven into the overall composition of the song. And in my opinion, it's produced in such a simple, effortless way that simultaneously gives you or gives me more than any other song on the album. Call it divinity, call it inspiration, call it talent, call it creativity, whatever it is about this song just absolutely floored me. In the beginning it lulls you in, you're not sure exactly where it's going or what to expect, especially in the context of the rest of the songs, and then somewhere along the way in Rising Arch it finds its melody and it grabs you and it just lulls you in and lulls you to sleep in this hypnotic, stunning way. Obviously, I don't even have the words. It's number two on this list, but it's subjectively my number one. Now, speaking of number one, we've finally made it. The best song on this album, in my opinion, is none other than the prologue, the introduction to the album. Similar to Rising Art, what is there to say about the song other than it almost made me cry? We are talking about a man, Masayoshi Takanaka, that is a guitarist, right? And yes, of course, a producer, composer, but a man who basically scored and composed a song that is comparable to film scores. Beyond making an already impressive album that without the prologue would leave us all still speechless, and yet he just decides to flex on us and open the album with a score. Yes, I love Rising Arch. That is subjectively my favorite, but I would be blasphemous if I did not say that this prologue, this opening track to the album, is the best, is a masterpiece. We're talking about a tier of artistry. Take, for example, Neil Diamond. Most of us know Neil Diamond for Sweet Caroline. There was a film called Jonathan Livingston Siegel, also based on a book titled Jonathan Livingston Siegel, and Neil Diamond literally composed the score for that movie. In addition to that, yeah, you could talk about some metal music that has classical components. You could talk about, say, Freddie Mercury, who would compose operatic pieces to the very complex compositional songs by Queen in the 70s. You could talk about the jazz rock band Chicago of the late 60s and early 70s, who would compose 10 to 15 minute 
compositional pieces that blow your mind. You could talk about Michael Jackson, who most people know for Smooth Criminal, Thriller, Billy Jean, Beat It, who in his own right later in his career would compose symphonies as introductions to his songs. I mean, that level of artistry. And Masayoshi Takanaka evidently with this song prologue is no different. Absolutely blew me away for me, clear cut number one with no argument, at least internally. And so there you have it, every song from the album The Rainbow Goblins by Masayoshi Takanaka ranked worst to best. Obviously it's subjective and obviously our opinions are going to differ, so please let me know in the comments down below what you agree with, what you disagree with, and how you would rank them yourself. Personally speaking, evidently I loved the album. It is one of the best albums I've listened to in a long time. I love the imagination. I had absolutely no problem with the narration and spoken word segments. From production to composition, top to bottom, in my opinion, a work of art in the truest sense. Let me know as well if you enjoyed this type of video, this new format that I am trying. And if you did, let me know which other albums you'd like for this channel to review worst to best as well. To be honest, a lot more work goes into this type of video than just reacting and then blindly reviewing something on the spot with no preparation. So because of that, part of me is considering making it an available tier on Patreon for just a few bucks a month, but first I wanted to at least gauge if you guys like it or not. As mentioned, if you'd like to support myself and the work I put into these videos, click the like button and subscribe to the channel. And of course, if you'd like to support the channel further, you'll find Music Kingdom's Patreon and other affiliate links in the description below. This has been another edition of Music Kingdom. Thank you so much for joining me, and I'll look forward to hanging with you in the next one.